Just admitting a few more people. So I'm gonna make a start by first uh, introducing uh, our speaker today, uh, Dr. Almedina, who works in Cadiz in Spain and has been doing uh, and has done a huge amount of research in lung ultrasound. She has already spoken to us and given us an absolutely amazing talk on uh, chronic lung disease and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, uh, something that we will be focusing on after the end of this month, including the diaphragm. I want to take this opportunity to thank her again for sparing her valuable time and speaking to us today. What we are going to do today is we're going to have four peer reviews. And after the peer reviews are over, we'll then have Dr. Almedina's talk uh, again. Uh, we're very, uh, you know, uh, keen for us to not limit questions. So if you have any doubts on any area in lung ultrasound, today's your opportunity to ask one of the best, the biggest experts in the world in lung ultrasound. So I am going to let uh, the lovely uh, Margarita uh, to start, please, Margarita, go for it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, it was um, a non-reassurance CTG that went to a C-section. It uh, the uh, amniotic fluid as meconium. It was a 40-week baby with 3510 grams. You need the positive pressure ventilation with going to feed a lot of oxygen. And he stay with the RBS in need of oxygen. He didn't have infectious risk and went to the NICU with, and it was put in CPAP with 40% of oxygen. Then he, that there need to, to arise and he was intubated with aggressive ventilation because he has a meconium aspiration syndrome. So you, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have courage to do the scan while he was unstable because each time we move him, he rises uh, oxygen and took a lot of time to go down. So he was extubate to here to, to, uh, to feel to 35%. And in the, the 14 day of life, he was in can nasal cannula with 0 0.1, 0 0.2 liters per minute when I did the loss. So these are the L, R1, R1 and R2. Okay, it's, it, it's, um, it's a, a thin pleural, it's a bit broken here. Well, we have A line, B lines with A lines underneath and maybe a deep consolidation here, I'm not sure. Um, and in um, R2, we can see also a, a thin pleural regular and A lines. I don't, well, there's some B lines, not very much. I think this is quite, uh, quite nice. Oh, so I can see it's a B profile here. And here, can I call it an A or it's too much? <laughs> I, I think I agree. I think that looks like an A profile to me. I, can you just let us know which probe you're using? You're losing a okay. I probe am. I, it's a G, uh, um, Vivid GA. I don't like the touch screen, not at all. <laughs> with a 12, a linear with 12 hertz. Okay, Very nice. So, yep. Uh, so just if you were to follow your uh, our guideline and report from the plural down, how... So, You've definitely got Plura all the way through. Yes. What do you think? Regular, continuous in R1? I think it's a bit real. It has some key, some broken here. Maybe it's not a thin, a pretty thin, but can I tell that it's a, um, uh, well, it's a bit thick. Yeah, it should be, it's thick, a bit thick. I, thought, I shouldn't say that it's linear, right? Sure. Fair point. I think you're absolutely right. It looks a little bit on the coarse side. Uh, definitely, uh, once you've seen sliding, what about sliding? Uh, yeah, I think it's sliding. Okay, excellent. And uh, once we've interrogated the plura, just further down, I, I, I think I'd completely agree. You definitely have a dominance of B lines, uh, you know, uh, definitely a few B lines that coalies possibly into a compact B line, especially on the right side of your screen. Yeah. And the question, again, from our perspective is whether you do have uh, a deeper consolidation yeah. on the right bottom yeah. side. Very good depth, up to four centimeters. Uh, nice visualization. Uh, your the, the beauty of the GE machine, uh, the Vivid that you use is you do not have to adjust uh, the actual uh, 
kind of uh, focus to be at the plural line in that it uh, yes. auto adjusts, yes. which is something that's really remarkable about it, which is why for our colleagues, I can see a marker there at two, but actually the new GE and Vivid doesn't actually need the marker to be anywhere. It actually auto adjusts to try and pixelate to the best quality. And that's why you can see, you know, the, the lungs in their entirety right down to the bottom. So very nice. Uh, any other comments? Anybody else think or have any questions from the group? Yeah, I have a doubt. Here, yeah. it's like it's like to be a track sign. Sometimes so you... Should we just play it again? Okay. So yeah, definitely on the, the right side. Uh, so if you just go to the right, just above the level of the diaphragm, there. I, I definitely think, and maybe in the middle as well. So, Here, but right. yeah, the it presence, yeah, it has B lines and the B lines move. So theoretically from your perspective, uh, you know, it's very unlikely that you've got a pneumothorax there. Yes. You do have a little bit of what I'd say is lung pulse. Uh, yeah. Do you think there's a mild diffusion there, small effusion? Maybe here, yes. Yep. Yeah, but just think that you've got a tiny effusion as well. So very nice. I, I would I would agree with that. W what do my other colleagues think? Uh, does anybody else anybody else want to comment? Uh, look, I don't know if you are finding every time this trap sign because sometimes when, uh, when we are doing some ultrasound and this is a profile, we notice this truck sign, but uh, M mode doesn't show any pneumothorax. I don't know if it is no, possible. So this is, this it is, and this is the important thing. It's a mirror artifact. So a mirror artifact, the presence of a truck sign in isolation with plural that's sliding in B lines, it is very much visible uh, in babies who don't have a pneumothorax. So, you know, in and that's the, that's, that's the importance that really those four signs for a pneumothorax are very important. The absence of plural sliding, uh, you know, the fact that you've got an A profile without B lines, uh, a barcode sign, and you must, where possible, demonstrate the lung point. So truck sign, yes, if it's present with all those signs is an additional feature, but you can actually see truck sign, you know, in an A profile rather than an A dash profile. So I, I wouldn't get too fixated on the fact that if you have a truck sign, you're always going to have an overthrax. In, look at all those signs and those four signs that I've just spoken about are very crucial. Please carry on. Uh, okay, this is R3 and R4. I think that's, that's not nothing special. It's uh, uh, We see a thin pleura with um, uh, sliding with uh, some B lines with the uh, A lines underneath in both sides. I think here the image, uh, especially in the R4, it's more dark, maybe a bit of gain here. Uh, sometimes I, I, I write the gain, but then everything stays very white. And I think I can see better with a bit less gain and then I can see, see A lines because yep. All the, so because if the game is too high, it's all, all white and everything it looks alike. Okay, but I think here there's nothing special. Yep, I would agree. Okay, so can I move? Yep. Excuse okay, me, here I? I try I try to do- S Sorry, I there's a somebody wanting to ask a question. Okay, sorry. Yeah, this is um, Almudena. Go for it, um, Almudena, yeah. Hello, thank you, and good, hello, everybody. I would like to also thank a lot for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure, and always I'm very thankful always for this uh, great special presentation that he does always, uh, which I don't deserve. I just wanted to make two comments. Um, this is uh, really quite images, the one that you've uh, showing us, Margarita. In the first one that you've already passed, you mentioned that you have doubts about a consolidation there. Um, there's, there's no, maybe there's a consolidation, but you cannot really see it because if you see it, it's, uh, um, unless you have a consolidation itself at the level of the pleural line, every, every, everything that you can see underneath is just uh, artifacts. Whichever you see, it cannot be a consolidation, never. I don't know if you understand the concept. 
unless that you have uh, fluid or consolidation at electrices, whatever you have underneath the pleural line are just artifacts. You don't really have that image itself in the lung. I don't know if you understand. I, I can't assume it because it doesn't uh, start in pleural. I just can assume yes. things that start in pleural, right? Yes, yeah. if it doesn't, then it can be, a, yes, it, it's just an artifact that you're seeing there, okay? It okay. cannot be a consolidation, never. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then the next one. Next, the, I, the other Yeah, one? the next slide, yeah. Um, uh, you were talking about the gain. Yes. You can modify the gain only in the lower parts of the image. Okay. That's a um, sectoral, gain. sectoral gain, right? Yes, and that's what should be recommended because sometimes it's very usual to see what you're seeing here in the image when you lose um, brightness in the lowest part, then you have to modify just the gain in that part of the of the image. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, don't change the global okay. the global gain. Yeah, but only the the gain that's in the lower part of the image. These are a specific um bottoms are that usually have uh, the machines that you move them from one side to side and okay. then you can just adjust, adjust the gain there in that location okay okay thank you so on the g that you have the vivid it will be lateral gain compensation and what you'll find is when you click on the screen it will give you a series of buttons which allow you to move from up to down so that you can actually alter the, the screen from up to down. Okay, now, it, yeah. now I, I try to do a plops uh, that we talk in Sunday. And here, can I assume there is a consolidation? No, no. Mm, no, no, again, you're seeing a thin plural line. Uh, you cannot have a consolidation if you're watching uh, plural line with B lines. It's the same concept. Okay. That we were saying before. You are seeing different density there, but probably it's an artifact. Okay. 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 Because if you see the plural line, it means that you have two um, um, two spaces or two fields with different in acoustic impedance. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, impedance of the water, which is the the subcutaneous tissue or whatever you have there. And then you have air, and this is what you why you have the pleural line drawn there, because you have a difference between two tissues with different acoustic impedance. And this is why uh, all echoes are reflected, and then the machine draws the pleural line. Okay. Okay. So that means that you you have air there, okay. with a bit of water or with uh, some um, inflammation, but you have mostly air. Okay. okay, so you cannot have a consolidation. Okay. Okay, so it's the same here. It's not, a, it's just the B lines with the pleuras, thin pleura. And here it's R6. I think this here, it was too low. Uh, it, I suppose it might be good, right? It's not. Yes, probably. Okay. Oh, and then it's it's the left lung gate and it's the, the same. It's a key, I think it's normal, right? Like I can say this normal lung or yes. And the, here also, it's the question, the key, okay, sectorial gain will be improved, right? I, I hear it, it's not yeah, probably. Four, it's five and with the sectoral gain, it would be better the image. Yeah. And, uh, Okay, it's. I think it's a. I think it's a, a, a McConnell syndrome in uh, uh, recuperation. I don't know if it's say that yet. You have to give him time. It's. Yeah, this is kind of like the, the type of images that you've seen after the acute phase of the aspiration syndrome, in which now pleural line is almost normal, but you see, still see a few areas with the B profile, a mixed A and B profile, which is an interstitial pattern. Okay. Yeah, that's the usual evolution. 
So and here I try to raise the pill flaps sign, see, and it was okay. So and here I try it's L L5, L6. This I changed the, the, the I keep I put some sharp in the, the but I, I don't think the image get much better because it's blur blurred. And you increase the depth too. Yes. I, it's not necessary, probably. What do you think? No. Okay. Okay, this was my first case. It, and the second, it's, it's very simple things. This is a, a newborn. It was a mother with a chronic kidney disease that had a kidney transplant rejection and developed a pulmonary edema. The, it was done a, a one dose of beta and the urgent fetal extraction. Extraction. It was a late preterm that born well, but starts to need in, in oxygen. It went to CPAP first in 40%, and then it, it drops quite fast, quite quickly to 25. And I did the scan at 12 hours of life. Here, it was to help me a bit with the, the, the scores. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it's skin, muscles, ribs, that sign. <laughs> And there's plural sliding, thin regular li plural line, A lines, and the counting of the lines. I think it's almost normal here. And so it was a, a profile with a broad score of zero. And here, maybe here we see most uh, most than two B lines and some coalescence. So I would give a 0.5 or one broad score. That's okay. Uh, here is the lateral. I have all three. Uh, here it's um, this. Well, maybe more gain give me more B lines here. The the pleuritine and regular is sliding. We have seen A lines beneath the B lines. Okay, maybe a, a bit of gain more in the a B profile, a broad score of one. Right? Yes. 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 Perfect. Here, okay, pleural sliding. I think a key pleural is a bit coarse, and uh, although it's regular, we have some compact B lines, but we have um, spare length zones here and here. Here, here it's more, it's more, um, it's more obvious because the B lines are more compact here and here. So it's a, 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 a IS um, interstitial syndrome of B profile. When I see is spare lung zones, probably it's not, it's more favorable to a TTBN and it's not to use BRAT score because it's not, BRAT score is for RDS. But if I have to, to classify it, I would give it a two, right? Am I doing a right? Um, this is a correct thought or not? Yes, uh, uh, if the question is about the number, yes, it will be number two. But the question about the scores, we use them, although we don't um, have an, a suspicion of an RDS. In, in publications about TTN, it's also used the same score, although it was first published with the aim to try to detect the infants with high risk of, of, of needed surfactant. It's, it was also used in TTN. We use it, we use the same score for BPD prediction okay. and so on. So this is R3 and R4. It's okay. It's the I think I uh, sorry. It's also spiral sliding, course pleura, regular, compact V line, spare lung. There is in, in the beginning, I think it was the same zone because it, this, the baby is small and the, the linear probe is big. Sometimes when we when I do R two uh, the, the 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 upper part and then the lower part, there is in the image this it's a, a zone of that is the same uh, lung. Okay. Well, here I can call it a, a white lung, right? Yes. So. 
So my conclusion, it was a brief profile when I, with the interstitial syndrome with spared zones. Yeah, well, it was a late preterm without uh, without corticoids, just one one dose, and uh, with no uh, no labor. So probably it's a TTNB. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You should also add that the pleural line was thin. You yeah. didn't saw consolidations. Um, there are spare zones which are against on RDS. We could also saw the double lung point, which some colleagues have suggested in the chat. So I think that we all agree it would be a TTN. Okay. The, the double lung point was here. You log in the first one, these parts here? No. No. These are quite good images. Uh, here? This is Maybe good. between this one and the previous one. I don't know if you had something in between. Yes, I have the L4 here, but I didn't put because it was too much images. The thing is that I'm not um, used to the 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 order where you show the images, but maybe this would be lateral? Or... Yes, lateral. Yeah, but maybe between this lateral and the posterior fields, maybe you would see more clear the double long point. Okay. Okay, because in the posterior ones that you show in the next slide, then maybe you have, you almost have a complete wide lung there. Okay. Okay. So it's what I have to show. Thank you a lot. That's beautiful. Fantastic. Really nice images and uh, food for thought. I mean, two really good diagnoses that you've kind of uh, made. Our next colleague who's going to present is. Uh, is Dr. Zaradin? Yes, hi, good evening. Yes. And then Dr. Hassoun after that. So Dr. Zaradin, go for it, you can share. Thank you. Can I go ahead? Please, by all means, all yours. Thank you. So um, this is a late preterm born at uh, 36 weeks uh, of gestation and six days, just under really term uh, with a birth weight of 2.7 kilos. Uh, he had mild respiratory distress to start, but he did not require much of a stabilization at birth. Uh, he was started on high flow nasal cannula, six liters per minute. Uh, however, he became um, unwell with respiratory distress, uh, severe signs of respiratory distress, and increasing oxygen requirement up to 45 and sometimes 50 percent. But he was at some point uh, even apneic, um, and his oxygen saturation really was hardly uh, in the high um, 80s. Uh, low 90s so he was uh, when he developed um, found apneic episodes he was uh, as a matter of urgency he was intubated and ventilated given surfactant one dose I've managed to do his first lung ultrasound scan just after intubation uh, and receiving the first dose of surfactant and then the second uh, scan was done a week later uh, when he was extubated and on high flow so I'm just gonna go through the first set of uh, lung scans. This is R1. The, the first um, uh, ultrasound, lung ultrasound scan was done obviously when he was unwell. So I, I was unable to do the, uh, the posterior uh, views. This is R1 and I can see um, the plural line uh, looks uh, coarse and regular with um, uh, subleural consolidations uh, and uh, what I think is a, a static bronchograms, uh, bronchograms. 
there is a uh, which each uh, he's now ventilated so we each we each breath i think i can see um some b profile with uh coalesced kind of uh, b profile but with inhalation uh, i can see the static bronchograms with the consultation it was a bit tricky at that point he was uh he was uh, very unwell my to be honest my main aim of the scan uh, at that stage was to exclude the pneumothorax. So how old is the baby at this age, Dr. Saladin? Uh, about, five, about five hours. Five hours. Uh, any history of meconium? Uh, no, not at all. Not no at history all. of meconium. Uh, okay. It was okay. straightforward uh, late return. Um, no rupture of membranes. Mother's not GBS positive. Not at all. No, no okay. risk factors of infections. Uh, it's just the fact that uh, mom went to, into labor. She did have a previous history of, uh, she, she's a known case of, a case of uh, thrombophilia. So she had one uh, pregnancy loss. During this pregnancy, she was on uh, aspirin and uh, low, low molecular weight heparin, which was stopped uh, recently uh, before the uh, heparin was stopped only two days prior to uh, delivery. Not it, sure if it was, what do we uh, think about the subplural area in R one? I'm just curious. I, I, I think it's. Uh, I, th I think it's. Uh, uh, to, to start off with, I, th I thought this might be a, a consolidation because of pneumonic uh, uh, changes, um, uh, and I was thinking of. Uh, congenital pneumonia as a as a possibility uh, honestly i wasn't expecting this uh, at the time of doing the scan i was as i said earlier the main aim of my scan is that sudden deterioration may and i was really keen to find a, a pneumothorax yeah uh, uh, my question is whether you know especially when uh, the baby kind of uh, uh inhales and you see aeration you actually yeah. get a visible shred sign I'm just wondering, Almedina, what do you think? I was answering the chat. I don't think we can see a shred sign here because you don't really have a static, a static consolidation in which you would see this red sign underneath the consolidation. You're seeing a, small, a, a big consolidation, not a subplural one, which yeah. is kind of recruiting when the, bay, when the ventilator insufflates the gas and it de-recruits when, when it, it sails. So um, you should have a static consolidation to see this red sign underneath the consolidation, which we are not seeing clearly now. We can definitely it's see like, some dynamic air bronchograms there just at the top when the, the baby inhales, do we think? No, I think both are, all of them are static. Okay. Although maybe, I think the movement that you see is the recruitment at the recruitment, but not it's the, the, the gas inside moving, I think. Sure. But just just to be sure, which which locations are those images from? Is it the right lung or yeah, right and is, left? No, this is R1 and R2. Uh, R1 on the left side of the screen, um, mm. and then going down, that that is uh, R2. So right anterior upper and right anterior lower. R2 would be okay. right anterior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then I moved on to the, uh, still on the right side, mm -hmm. laterally. So uh, <laughs> perhaps the, uh, the sliding of the blura is clearer here. But still, you can see the uh, uh, consultation uh, just beneath yeah. the sewer line, as well as the air bronchograms with the dominant uh, B profile. I can't see any uh, A lines except on R1. If we move to R1 uh, going um, inferiorly, there is perhaps uh, one a line or some a lines that i can see to the very right of uh, r4 images but otherwise again it is the uh, mainly b profile 
I would agree. I think, you know, subplural consolidations, static air bronchogram uh, in R3 right in the middle, kind of a compact beeline appearance uh, and, you know, uh, features very suggestive of an RDS over here in R3 and R4. Uh, Dr. Albinina, any any comments? Anything? No, um, unless this is more or less the, the pattern shown in the other lung it doesn't seem to be a, a congenital pneumonia because yeah, yeah. it doesn't have really spare areas. Yeah. It's more or less the same. It's a de-recruited lung. Maybe this baby uh, should have benefited from- um, Higher pressure. More pro yeah. 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 Go for it, um, please carry on, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm just gonna move to the left lung to see um, the pattern being a widespread. And the L1 um, images again, um, showing a not a clearly defined pleura. And I think probably that is disturbed by the uh, consolidation underneath it and a, a B profile with the heart beating also interfering with the images. Um, if I exclude the heart beating, it is pretty much a replication of R1, I would say. Um, uh, and then uh, on L2, again, the pleura is probably better defined, still uh, a bit broken at certain points with the sub pleural consolidation. And then the B profile, the air bronchogram, uh, so similar pattern. Might be, uh, there might be some, um, a lines, perhaps some of them, but here it is predominantly the uh, air, air, air bronchi bronchograms. And then, yes, as, as, as you are explaining quite good, the the lung is is more or less the same. The whole all images uh, show similar uh, signs in which you are seeing a de recruited lung in a late preterm infant, which is maybe should have benefited from higher pressures or surfactant, as, as you said, this is performed before surfactant administration. And um, in, there was someone in, in the chat asking whether if there was um, uh, the uh, double lung point in the previous slide in R4, I'll go back to R4. Uh, is he is he talking about here? Maybe that point. Really, uh, the concept of double long point is um, what we see in the in the in the TTN. Yeah. Instead of seeing different patterns in the same image, usually we see better. Uh, aeration in the non-dependent areas, which will be anterior or higher areas, and worse aeration, a sharp decrease in lung, a sharp increase, sorry, in lung ultrasound score or increase of B lines in in most depending areas, in posterior or lateral areas. But this is not the concept of double lung point. This is just an area that seems to be a bit more aerated in which in which we don't see consolidation, we see again the pleural line, we see just one or maybe two A lines. So it seems like in the in the lower part of the lung, this is this concrete area is a bit more aerated, but that's not the concept of the double lung point. So what Almedina is saying is it's a really important point. So if we just go back to that image, it's really So especially if you go to the left bottom of your image, what you're seeing is well aerated lung and the, the markers of the lung being better aerated as compared to when you know you go to the extreme left of the image where you've got kind of a B profile with subplural consolidations is the visibility of the pleural line. Now, if you can see pleural line, then you definitely have some element of aeration up to the pleura. So really it's it's not a double lung point. And as Almudina has kind of alluded to, we should theoretically use the, the concept of a double lung point when we're talking about TTN. I mean, this looks like a pretty well-established RDS at the moment. 
it'll be interesting to see what your other images show. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so <laughs> just to show you the um, um, left lateral views. Again, they are showing uh, same findings of the um, plural sliding with the subplural consolidation or even deeper consolidation with a predominantly B profile on the picture, both on the uh, upper and lower left lateral uh, views. Um, so clinically, um, my reflection on, on, on these scans is that I was actually, uh, in a way, I was pleased because uh, um, I could say confidently that there wasn't a pneumothorax explaining the the pretty sudden deterioration in this baby. So uh, I was to some extent confident and I, I was pleased with myself um, excluding that. Uh, then uh, the... Uh, Obviously, you, your um, comments, um, Alok and Al Medina, spot on. I, I think uh, we gave this perfectant, but uh, still, we went up on the on the ventilator settings. It looks like the lung did not resp respond just for the surfactant. They needed a bit of more pressure, so the pressure went up. Uh, maximum was uh, twenty six peak uh, inspiratory pressure. Once I think we we reached that. That opening point, um, things have improved overnight, and baby was actually uh, oxygen requirement were, went down from sixty percent down to by the, the by the following morning it was about twenty five percent, and the blood gases were much much better, so it started weaning and the baby was extubated and I uh, I didn't get a chance to repeat the scan until the uh, seventh day and here are the scans. Uh, on day seven, uh, with these, uh, this time I was able to do even the uh, posterior uh, images as well. So this is the uh, right upper and right lower. Uh, again, very nice looking uh, plural line with sliding comet tails, predominantly A profile with A lines, uh, nicely seen. Uh, the air bronchogram has disappeared, I guess, and uh, both right uh, upper and right lower anterior are showing uh, the same picture. I think on R2, the, probably the liver is uh, coming into the image every now and then. Just, just, just two comments. Yeah, you are doing quite well. And you're interpreting the, the the improvement of the image quite well, but maybe just to comment on, you don't need that depth in your image. You have five centimeters. Maybe you could have reduced this a little bit, and also changing the time gain compensation, the 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 gain in the lower part of the image. Maybe um, you could have changed it not to see it that dark there, like the previous colleague that was also explaining it her case, Margarita, okay? Thank you. Which machine are you using, sir? Uh, Sonocyte. Sonocyte, okay, yeah. So again, it's worth having a look at whether you have time gain compensation or lateral gain compensation, because they'll change the images slightly differently. Uh, yeah. One of them will be vertical. And like, if you have the, the GE, the, uh, it, it tends to have what I'd say is lateral gain compensation. So it actually moves, and changes the image uh, in a slightly different way. And in the GE, often you have to sort of reduce the frequency to get a little bit of better imaging from the depth. But in the sonar side, you, if you have time gain compensation, then actually you can actually do partial segments in every area, which is beautiful. It's a very nice machine. So I would just look for the button of time gain compensation. I've made, I've made a note of it. So I'll, uh... yeah. Okay. So I the, yeah, we'll contact the uh, rep as well. Lovely. Well done. Thank you. Uh, can I move on to the next? Go for uh, it, please, please. So these are the uh, R3. And so this is the lateral views. Again, um, uh, tourist sliding, um, no air bronchograms. The uh, consolidation is not visible and it's mainly an A profile. 
that's both on the right upper yeah. left yeah. right left yeah. lateral I'm just going to the now to the uh, left side uh, sorry this is the posterior uh, so these are the posterior views uh, which we did not um, we did not have obviously because of the condition of the baby but now it's a and these were done first because the baby was actually prone so I did the uh, both posterior right and left uh, first and then uh, the baby was turned over and I did the uh, the anterior so he's been on prone for some time when these images were taken and again, uh, uh, there's a very clear plural sliding with uh, uh, A profile, uh, A lines all the way through on both right upper and right lower posteriorly. I'm just going to move to the... Very nice images. Thank you. And this is the uh, left side uh, again um, uh, comet tails would, would very I think it if to me looks a, a very good um, um, opportunity to um, train my eye on plural sliding um, mm -hmm. comet tails and uh, a profile uh, perhaps I have lost some of the contact here at this point or maybe it's the heart uh, causing this. Probably and, the heart, yes. Yes. And then that's the left uh, anterior lower, L2. Mm -hmm. Similar findings. I'm just going to go to the lateral uh, views on the left side. Uh, again, uh, very clear plural sliding with uh, uh, normal plural uh, image, uh, A profile. Perhaps every now and then there might be some remaining, not sure if that's correct, but remaining uh, B uh, profile, especially on the L3. Um, but that's probably just a sign of improvement, I guess. Yeah. The L4. Uh, there is there is mainly it's an a profile uh, image with uh, plural sliding and comet tails as well and then finally the uh, uh, posterior images for the left side and they are showing showing pretty much similar picture to the uh, findings on the lateral uh, baby is comfortable uh, Quite a normal scan. Yeah. 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 Very just, nice images, well performed. Thank you. And this is finally just the X-ray. This is the first chest X-ray, just before uh, intubation, and that was uh, this baby actually after intubated and given surfactant and uh, increased um, ventilatory pressure, uh, there was a significant uh, improvement radiologically on the X-ray. Um, although it was not reflected immediately on the ultrasound. So this That's... timeline between these two, these two X-rays is about uh, three hours mm -hmm. on That's... the same day, on the day of birth. Yeah, That's one of the limitations that we have using lung ultrasound in which you see clinical improvement uh, after surfactant, but you don't see uh, an improvement in, in, in ultrasonographic signs until at least six hours after the treatment, because you have to think that you are uh, uh, introducing a liquid inside the lungs. So more or less the, the image that you see are quite similar until that surfactant is um, absorbed into the lung and it disappears, you don't begin to see an improvement or not. But you can see a clinical benefit before you see an improvement in, in, lung, in the images really. It, I think the point that you said at the beginning of your presentation, it's quite important in which you said I was pride because I was able to rule out a pneumothorax in this infant. So 
with with what you've learned now, you're able to distinguish quite well uh, the reason for a, a clinical deterioration of your of your infant, and that's I think that's very important. You see the 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 usefulness of of this of using lung ultrasound in the, in clinical scenarios in real clinical settings. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm I'm very very. Uh... I was and I am very, very happy with this. And um, thanks to you all. I think it's a, a magnificent um, achievement. Thank you so much. That's all to you do your hard work. So just one last question, uh, Dr. Zaradin. Uh, clinically, I mean, in terms of infection, uh, culture is negative, CRP is normal? Absolutely, yes. It, the baby had a normal CRP all the way through. The blood cultures were negative. Um, uh, I start. By the way, I, I started him on antibiotics. No, no, absolutely. I think in our part of the world, we wouldn't risk it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, again, a, a very nice, uh, you know, kind of a ultrasound to kind of demonstrate subpleural consolidations, and you know what is kind of quite a severe presentation of RDS with a good response to surfactant. So you know, my compliments. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. The next person who is going to share with us is Dr. Hassoun. Please go ahead, Dr. Hassoun. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Good evening, all. Just share the screen. I'm audible and visible. That's correct. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is just a case of 35 weeks, uh, C-section delivery and meconium, uh, multigravida muscle and GBS negative, uh, gut respiratory distress admitted to SCABU, high flow nasal cannula, FIO 2.6, and then intubated and giving Cervanta. Uh, this is, and this is, was this was in the night. So I did ultrasound the second day, but after 12 hours of Cervanta just to see uh, what is the finding? What could I find on, on lung ultrasound with meconium aspiration syndrome? The chest X-ray was typical for meconium aspiration syndrome with heterogeneous patchy infiltrate bilaterally. So I will start by uh, right lung, right upper, R1. Um, just one second. Sorry for that. Uh, so for this one, sorry, but I cannot keep it in loop. Just one second. It's okay. Don't worry. I think I got that. So I, sorry, I will keep it like this so I couldn't. Uh, it's okay. It They're very uh, nicely visible. Yeah. Well, this is just for me, this is a, a good uh, plural sliding, sin plura, but just there is a lot of B line with B profile on right on up, right anterior up, upper zone. And there is here shred sign for me and I don't know if I'm doing this very well, but I, this is there is some shred sign on this view on right R1 uh, was sub was the consolidation. I don't know if it is this is right or not. So on the R2 right down, uh, also the same plura is uh, sliding. There is B profile and uh, sorry, this is the second one. So, and there is also suspicion here of shred sign and atelecta, this consolidation. I couldn't put, uh, I forget to put the Doppler on this uh, image. So I don't know what is your input, Dr. Aluk or Dr. Al Modina. Yeah, I think you can see consolidations in and shred sign almost in all the images that you've shown, that you uh, presented. Um, on, both, on both view, on right upper and right lower. And the one that you have in the right light, yeah, there you can see if you and can stop also. it. Yes, in both. Oh, okay. But okay. the ones in the the ones in the in the right are in the, sorry in the left one are bigger, and those in the yeah. Here. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. you you can see the well. This is not really a red sign because this is quite sharp. The the limits between the consolidation and the rest of the lung, but it will be probably atenect atenectasis, not a pneumonia. That's what, is but this is more or less, yes, this is more or less the concept of 
consolidation, um, different from the other images that we've seen from the other colleagues. Okay. You so you lose possible. the plural. You you lose the the plural line. You see a consolidated area, and underneath it, you see hypergogenic line that's kind of uh, separating the consolidation from the rest of the lung. Okay. Okay. So next one, this is uh, lateral view right uh, lung, R, R3, R4. Here's the R3. Also, the pleura is sliding here. And B profile mainly. Some A I could see in the middle. And also the same, uh, sub, some subpleural consolidation. Uh, for the R4, here uh, the pleura is sliding also some B line. And I, say, I could... Uh, CA a profile, so AB profile, but no atelectasis or subconspural consolidation. That's right, yes? Yes. Were oh. there uh, analytical signs of infection in this baby? No, no, CRP, the first CRP, uh, two CRP were, was, uh, first one was uh, negative, the second one little bit rise just till 10, not, not more. And the baby after Cerventa, he was giving Cerventa. So we, we moved from FIO 2.6 to 2.21 after 12 hours. Okay. So um, this is the left side. Uh, sorry. Ah, this is still, still here, the posterior part of the right lung. Okay, also B profile and uh, some subpleural consolidation and with A line. So AB profile was. I don't think this is subplural also consolidation. Yes, there is subplural consolidation. Um, no. no. No, only uh, just a tiny little one in the third intercostal space, but just less than 0.5 millimeters. Yes, that's, that's okay. the only one that I can see there. Okay, fine. So uh, here, this is uh, L1, lung, left lung, left upper. Here also there is some B line with A, so A B profile. Yes. Um, sorry, maybe I got confused here a little bit. Uh, sorry, this is this is um, the L two. This is L one, L two. Sorry, I, I mistake it. But also the same issue we comment on it, and. Here's the last one, this two. Also the AB profile with some sub subleural consolidation one. And here AB profile. But just I was so confused from the first image. Uh, if I can, could it, this is a shred sign or a telectoris. I couldn't find it just from at the beginning. This is my worry here. What, what was this? Is a shred sign or this one? Or what is this, this image with hypoecogenicity here? It's not oh, irregular can... enough yeah, for me to be shred sign, but let's see what Almedina thinks. Yeah. It's no, yeah, it seems uh, it, it seems like an atelectasis. You don't yeah. see a brogogram in the inside. The you don't really see the stress sign. You see an intersection between the consolidation and the rest of the lung, but this is quite kind of sharp, not really like a thread, and probably it will be an atelectasis. The the main issue is why this patient does have this atelectasis in this location. You know, because the rest of the lung seems quite good aerated and he has improved clinically also. So but that, that was, I was asking about uh, signs of infection, maybe it could also be uh, uh, congenital uh, malformation of the lung, maybe, or maybe it could be this uh, an aspiration, not, not a meconium aspiration, but maybe blood aspiration or amniotic aspiration after birth. I don't know. I, I should have uh, wanted to see previous images when the baby was more unstable to try and to decide, and also yes. to see the evolution in the in the in the next days. Unfortunately, decide. I mean, when when was they give Cervanta, it was in the night, so we did it just a second day to see what the, what is our finding. Yeah, that's very usual. So, and this, uh, you think that if we put put a Doppler here, it will help? Well, not really. Not really, because you're not seeing anything inside. You're just watching the lung uh, collapse there. That's a uh, natalectasis. Yeah. Probably yeah. you won't see anything at all. However, in neonates, the, the, the point of having a static or 
uh, uh, static bronchogram, moving bronchogram, uh, uh, different uh, organization in Doppler exams is not that validated as in adult or children uh, references. So it's not that useful really. Thank you. Thank you. This is just one case. I well will, done. Uh, I will, well done. I will give. I will give the opportunity to the other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hassoun. Our last presenter today is Dr. Doris. Uh, Doris, uh, we have about five more minutes. So, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to present. I'll just, I'll just take this away. Okay, so the case I'm presenting, uh, it's a case of a 23 plus six weeker who is corrected to 29 weeks um, um, today, well, yesterday actually, was at day 37 of life for 705 grams at birth. He was born by spontaneous, oh, sorry, slide show. He was born by spontaneous vaginal delivery um, unexpected, but mom had two doses of steroids, was intubated, had Curacef at birth. And I mean, the initial initial two to three weeks um, of life, he was stable on the ventilator, treated for the first 48 hours with um, antibiotics for suspected sepsis. And the first time they attempted to extubate him, um, because he was still in a significant amount of oxygen, they started um, postnatal steroids. And, but just before the end of the, of the course, he came on well and was noted to have blood cultures um, showed late onset GBS. So had a 10 day course of IV antibiotics and he was reintegrated again at that point. So um, like 10 days ago, or oh, it was another course of um, steroids were started in a bit to try to extubate him. And um, halfway through, he became tachycardic and well, we screened him again and he grew GBS again and we started antibiotics. Um, but because he was not as unwell as he was previously, we just extubated him and he was on um, CPAP or BiPAP in the, and his oxygen requirement started rising and we just could not account for that. So I'm just showing his x-rays, the transition. This was the first section on the right is at birth after he was born, he was in the intubated lines were put in. And at one month of age, this is after he was reintubated again, um, after the first course of postnatal steroids. Okay, so the ultrasound. So I did the ultrasound scans yesterday because of increasing oxygen requirements, frequent desaturations. And I just wanted to see what was going on. And this is the first scan, R1. Um, so as you can see, the plural looks continuous, but it does look irregular. There is plural sliding scene. And um, it, it looks irregular and below the plural, whether these are um, so plural consolidations, um, all mainly B lines, it looks compact um, to me. So this is certainly a B profile at yep. my top. And so because I thought the plural looked quite irregular, I zoomed in to try to interrogate that area um, of consolidation. And um, so looking at this area, you can still ap appreciate the irregularity of the plural, the plural sliding. And then I was looking at this area and this area, and I was um, wondering, at, is this dynamic air bronchograms? Is this shred sign? Um, or, or Sorry? More subtle consolidations, I would suspect. And my only comments, are, I mean, like when you look at R1 in particular, uh, it's kind of a whiteout uh, as opposed to compact B lines. And what's your gestation? 23 weeks wait? Um, baby was 23 weeks at birth. At now is corrected to 29 weeks. He was and wait. He was 700 grams at birth. Currently okay. now he's 1.2 kilograms. Sure. Sure. Okay. That's really helpful. Yep. It looks more like a whiteout to me as I, opposed I, to, yep. Yes. I agree. Yeah. Almedina, any, anything else you'd like to add? Go for well, it. The thing is that to understand these images, we should need to see the have, previous ones. 
Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> maybe this is the, the the images. Maybe this is the images that this patient has for, since birth, or at least since two or three weeks before. Um, the what this images is telling you that probably you have ruled out complications because you are really insulating the baby because you think that maybe there's something that may seem worse. Um, you see that there doesn't seem to have a pneumonia. Uh, and also common pneumonia can be ruled out with these images, um, at least in these areas. Probably what you can understand from these images is something that we're going to review in the talk that we will be having today, is that maybe this infant's not ready to be excavated. Okay, because you're still seeing a, a completely white lung, at least in these in this areas that you're watching now. Yeah, you can yeah. rule out pneumothorax with this thing. You you can with these images you can rule out uh, pneumonia, and you can rule out atelectasis due to position. Probably this infant will have these images um, since uh, weeks ago. And, and probably this is a patient evolving to a BPD and in which you can see that this lung's not ready yet to be excavated. Is it because PDA? Is it because an evolving BPD? Is it, but the-, no, the... No PDA. We excluded PDA. Um, so okay. I, I did not, unfortunately, I didn't do an ultrasound much earlier on to see what there was a transition, but these are the images. I did it because his of the rising oxygen requirement and in a bit, and I did it before I did an extra because I said, let me see what the lungs look like. And I mean, it, I do agree. It seems like white out dense B lines, which I, was, I found really puzzling at this age, that seven days old, um, corrected to 29 weeks. And yeah. Okay. That's an evolving BPD. It's just, you, yeah. And so I, I really couldn't get an R2 view, uh, uh, an R2 view, and uh, from the, the x-rays will show why, because his abdomen was so gaseously distended and his lungs were so, were being pushed and squashed. So this was the R3 view. I took it um, in the axillary area. And um, sorry, where is it? Oh, sorry, back, okay. And as you can see, is. um, the same, you can appreciate pleural sliding, the irregularity of the pleura. I thought it looked thick and whether these were signs of subpleural consolidations and mainly B profile. Um, on, with this, in this view, I mean, the last um, R1, the B lines were so, you know, it seems like white out, but this one, you can, I can't see any A lines anyway, but it doesn't seem as compact or white out as the other, the R1 view, but, as you can appreciate, it's just mainly B lines. I couldn't see any. I couldn't see any A lines. So I actually tried to zoom in to look closely at at this area also. Um, I was suspecting whether these are also subpleural consolidations. Um, but just below the pleural. Are they? But this is normal due to the position. Probably the baby was in supine position. Well, he was this just not. Yeah, this is not a, a a clinically significant consolidation, just very small ones. That's what we call subpleural consolidation. Although, um, as Nadia Youssef told you uh, a few weeks before, that Dr. Daniel Lanchestein doesn't want us to say that, that to use that term, but those are sm small atelectasis at the level of the pleural line. That will be the concept that some people use to say to pleural consolidation. When you find the bigger one, that's when you call it extensed consolidation. Okay. My um, only other comment, uh, do you really need a depth of five? Because what is happening is you're losing out on the deeper part of your image. So especially in a baby this small, you might actually not need that much depth. You're actually hitting five and a half. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, this R5 view, I took the view at the level of the posterior axillary, axillary line because I couldn't turn him to do um, the posterior view. So it's all this mimics the same, as you can see, plural sliding, regular plural B profiles. Now the left, the left um, side, L1, um, 
can still appreciate the dense um, in B lines, plural sliding, but the plural looks more irregular. And at this point, I thought that whether this was shred sign because the plural seems broken. Yes. It's continuous at this point. Yes. Okay. All right. So I zoomed in again to look closely at that side, and you can see what it looks like. It certainly made me increase my suspicion of shred sign. Um, as, as dense as it was. Um, so I tried to put the color Doppler on at that point, but I don't know why I couldn't get it better than this. So I just abandoned it. In case that you want to use Doppler, then it will be better at what Alok told you that decrease the depth of okay. the image. Okay. All right, I'll try that next time. So L2 um, is still all B profile, in, plural looking thick and irregular. And then this point at L2, um, I think this is shred sign. Um, yes. The plural is broken at this point. Yes. Okay. And L5 taken at the level of the posterior auxiliary line on that side. Um, the same, just mainly B profile, plural looking irregular, especially around this area. It looks thicker than the other side. And um, sorry. same thing, that was the same thing. So, so I looked at, after the x-rays, after the, the long ultrasounds, and I went to look at the rest of the x-rays, he had an x-ray three days before, this was why he was extubated, three days before. So you can see how his lung fields look, his lots of gas in his abdomen. And then this was the x, oops, sorry. So this was the x-ray that was done after the long ultrasound, and you can see, um, how gaseously distended his abdomen was. His lungs were virtually looking collapsed, which explained virtually, like he said, white out appearance on his lungs. So we started diuretics and um, we just reintubated him. He was still on the course of antibiotics for late onset GPS. So that um, continued. I, I actually, my, my reflection, I thought it was quite interesting. I did the long ultrasounds first before I, I, I requested the X-ray and I was actually quite surprised to see how white out his lungs were at this age. And it was one of the questions I was going to bring that, is this a sign of evolving chronic lung disease? Um, so, and yeah, then I did yeah. the X-ray and it confirmed that yes, his lungs were looking white out. White, either they were collapsed or um, as these were all mainly signs of evolving chronic lung disease. So yeah, well, thank you. It could have been, uh an acute RDS secondary to the sepsis also, but you wouldn't see the, the, the lung so homogeneous. You would see some areas with consolidation, small ones, bigger ones, other areas better aerated, would be like uh, um, uh, meconium aspiration syndrome, well, the images that you would see. Uh, okay. But in that case, when you see such homogeneous lung all white out, that probably is an evolving BPD, what you are seeing. Maybe you should rule out pulmonary hypertension also, if the baby is with uh, many fluctuations in, in oxygenation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the oxygen requirement were close to 70 to 80% at the time of this x-ray, so, okay. Definitely okay. needs uh, uh, recruitment, lung <laughs> recruitment, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. I think this sets up uh, a really good uh, kind of a session because uh, Almedina is actually going to talk to us about that. And uh, I, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Almedina. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, should I begin now? Go for it, you all yours. My... Yeah. Yes, okay. beautiful, visible and audible. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to divide the talk into parts in which the first one will be um, about uh, prediction of admission to NICU for respiratory distress in, in, in term or late preterm infants. And then we're gonna talk about the optimization of respiratory support mainly in preterm infants. Um, so please uh, 
go ahead and ask whatever you need. You, you may interrupt me whenever you want. Um, the thing is, why this is not working? Okay. The first thing will be uh, talk about which is the normal aeration after birth in preterm infants using lung ultrasound. You all know now in this uh, part of the course that you have to see this, uh, this more or less this image. This is the concept or normal aeration that we have in all ages, not just in newborns. Uh, we have this um, subcutaneous tissue here, the ribs, intermuscle, uh, inter, intercostal muscles, then the pleural line, these A, B li A lines, no B lines. But this is not the normal in the first hours of life, as you all know that you are beginning to perform uh, lung ultrasound exams in your patients. Um, in the delivery room, there's a group in Australia that began to uh, evaluate the lungs using lung ultrasound at the level, at the level of the axilla, just uh, in the very seconds after birth in term newborns. And, and this is some videos that they provided in the publication in which you can see that when the lung, uh, when the baby is born, the lung is completely uh, collapsed, as you can see here. And after two, three, four seconds, then you can see how it progresses to a, a completely wide out lung. Or in this one here, you can see the progression from a consolidated lung here, and then it moves to a, a consolidation with air bronchogram uh, that progresses with the respirations of the baby to a white out lung. So, this is the normal progression of aeration using lung ultrasound in asymptomatic term infants without respiratory distress. And this is what we have to know to decide whether if a baby that has respiratory distress is um, doing a quite good transition in after birth or not. And this same group that, um, that we are talking about performed another study afterwards in which they observed how lung ultrasounds were changing after birth in term infants without respiratory distress and without congenital malformations. And they evaluated the infants at the first 10 minutes of life. In the second 10 minutes, then in one hour, two hours, four hours, and 24 hours of life. And this is what they saw. They divided the images that they got in the axilla of these patients in infants with this uh, normal aeration, which they call it uh, like a pattern number three, thin pleural line with A lines, no B lines at all. Pattern number two, in which you can see an increase of number of B lines with thin pleural line. And pattern one, in which you can see a white felt uh, lung, completely uh, full with uh, cholesterol B lines. And they divided the infants in the profile that they showed in, in both lungs. Bilateral type three will be the normal aeration that we are used to see in asymptomatic patients. Then we have type two in one lung and three in another, two bilateral two and, and so on. So in the first 10 minutes, you can say that this type three bilateral type three was only seen in 20% of the infants, term infants asymptomatic without respiratory distress and more or less the same in the next 20 minutes and in the next hour. So if we are watching, if we are evaluating a term infant with respiratory distress and we see um, this pattern here or here, maybe that infant is still transitioning. Maybe the lungs still full of water and we are not able to see whether the infant is uh, will need um, uh, in admission to NICU for for the distress that, that he or she has. However, after two hours or, or mostly after four hours, almost all infants progress to a bilateral type three. You see four, six hours is a bit later than the time that we usually spend evaluating an infant with uh, distress and until uh, for 24 hours is not when practically all infants had this bilateral type three pattern. And they also evaluated this, dividing the infants in the type of delivery that they had. They divided them in those born by vaginal delivery, a cesarean section without labor or elective cesarean section. And you can see that there are differences between the groups in the first 
10 minutes, 10, uh, 20 minutes, then an hour. And there's always a decrease of aeration, a decrease of removal uh, um, uh, lung water, extravascular lung water in those babies born with, uh, without labor by an alleged cesarean section. And it, uh, it continues to improve after two hours. And then practically um, it was equal the, the part on the, the, the profile, the bilateral three profile in the three groups after four hours of age. So you can see how the, the lung, the extravascular lung water is removed uh, slowly in infants uh, born without labor by a, an electrocesarian section. But you can see that there's this progression of aeration, the normal aeration of a term baby is different from the aeration of other ages. But this is not, um, this is not only in the first hours of life, in the first day, what happens afterwards. Oh, in this uh, study, um, uh, colleagues from an Italian center in Rome, they analyzed the progression of lung ultrasound aeration in healthy term babies in the first seven months of, and the six, six months of age. And they analyzed the number of fields where they have um, three or more long B lines in, in every field. And you can see that at 10 days of life, almost uh, one third percent, one third of the infants had this um, image of more than three uh, long B lines and interstitial pattern, although they were completely asymptomatic at birth and didn't have respiratory distress. And it remained one month uh, and, and three months, only just about 10% of the infants had this uh, image, but at six months of age, none of them did have more than three B lines in interior fields, both right anterior and left anterior. So this is important because as you have seen now, the progression of normal aeration in, in infants, in term infants, newborns, is not the same as in other ages. So this will be an, an, an schema of how normal aeration of, of the lung is seen in, in, a, in term infants, in which we can see both lungs with a thin pleural line, um, a pattern or maybe a B pattern with uh, separated B lines, mostly in posterior areas, more dependent areas. But um, to understand and to interpret this, you can see this, as, as we have been explaining before, the aeration of the most dependent areas is like more deficient or more slow um, than the rest of the areas that we are evaluating. So in most of the studies that we are going to review now, the posterior areas of the lung are not uh, evaluated in the first hours of life to try to, to detect which infant would be the highest risk of being admitted in the NICU. So now uh, we're going to review the evidence that we have published up to date about prediction of admission to NICU due to respiratory distress using lung ultrasound. And this is the first paper that we got in 2012, in which an Italian group from Naples analyzed the, the patterns of aeration according to these three categories that we've been explaining before and the needed of admission afterwards. Um, I remember that we have this normal aerated lung, which is the a th pattern three profile. Then we have an interstitial pattern or increase of the number of B lines will be number two, and the cholestin B lines will be number one. And they analyze the infants according to the need of oxygen requirement or respiratory support and the need of admission to NICU. And you can see how uh, all patients, 95 patients with this type three pattern, didn't require admission to NICU. And those all infants with this pattern uh, after one, two hours of birth required admission to NICU and most of them required respiratory support. However, most of the infants, um, just four out of 46, required admission when they have this um, bilateral type two profile. So taking these results into account, the existence of a type one, a bilateral type one pattern in the lung of a term infant in the first one, two hours of life had this sensibility, specificity, and positive and negative predictive values for being admitted to NICU due to respiratory distress. So this is important because we can use these images to decide 
if an infant has to be transferred to an hospital to a different hospital if i work in level one or level two NICU maybe i need to transfer this baby to another uh, place to, to where he would have different respiratory support or maybe i should pay more attention and i should more monitor that infant more carefully in the next few hours because that patient probably would need more uh, attention from the from our part this study is performed just taking into account both upper interior lower interior and lateral fields which will be r1 2 and 3 i think from from your or from your schema and they didn't take into account posterior fields as we were explaining before so another italian group a few a few years later performed this study in which they used similar methodology but they um they only analyze infants born by a cesarean section whether they have a ttn or rds whether they were 10 infants or lay preteen infants um, but they wanted to know, as we all know, that, that those babies born after a cesarean section without labor do have a decrease or, or slowly uh, removal or of extravascular water. Maybe these results could be um, reproducible in this population. And they did. In this study, all infants that required admission to NICU had a both type one in, in both lungs, as you can see here, well, almost, almost all infants. There was one with uh, one type one and one type two lung and another uh, one with a type two uh, bilateral. But uh, most infants that they didn't require admission to NICU had this uh, type three in, in both lungs. So you can see that there's, uh, um, the, the lungs uh, didn't show the same progression as the ones before, because infants that didn't require admission to NICO both had this two type two profile, but also you have to pay the attention that when you see this pattern here, whether it's the baby is born by a cesarean section or, or vaginal delivery or, or not, then you have to think that this baby has a high risk of being admitted to, to NICU, okay? However, this study published um, a few years ago by a Chinese group, they performed it a bit differently and they divided the pattern shown in, in the lungs of the infants according to this classification that they uh, created of low risk patterns or high risk patterns in which they had the A pattern or B patterns with more separation or reduced separation of B lines compared to a group of high-risk patterns in which they included cholesterol B lines or wide out uh, lung or the existence of consolidations. And they analyzed the risk of needing any type of respiratory support, which would be uh, the black image, the black uh, line, or the need of invasive mechanical ventilation, which would be the blue line. You can see that both high-risk uh, patterns did have a high area under the curve for being admitted or requiring invasive mechanical ventilation. However, the low risk patterns do have also a high area under the curve for not being admitted. And this is area under the curves, and this is the, the risk, the old ratio of predicting admission in, in the babies with an A line pattern or B pattern, in which um, there's a decrease of the risk of being admitted compared to infants with cholesterol B lines or consolidations that uh, have uh, doubled the risk of, of being admitted to NICU. They also analyzed not just anterior and lateral fields, but also posterior fields, and they counted the number of fields in which the infant had this high risk or low risk patterns, and they got these results in which if you see two or more fields with high risk patterns that increase the risk of being admitted to NICU or the, the, the risk of requiring invasive mechanical ventilation. And now, I don't know if you have more questions or comments or something that you want to clarify about this. Is it all clear? Wanted to show you a few cases of how we do it. 
this is a term infant um, born by uh, vaginal delivery that require resuscitation at birth and um, that develop respiratory distress in the delivery room. And then we perform lung ultrasound in the first 30 minutes of life. And you can see here this images, this will be uh, one lung, anterior, upper anterior, lower anterior of the left lung and lateral one in which you see um, subcutaneous tissue, the ribs, the pleural line, which is sliding. Then you see a, a, both A lines and just a few B lines, okay? This will be a, a B pattern, interstitial syndrome in all fields evaluated. This will be a low risk pattern. This infant, although she had respiratory distress, we already knew that wouldn't need admission to NICU, could, could, could be with her mother, which was the case. Finally, uh, just in a few hours, you're only required to be uh, a, a, a short period of observation in the, in the maternity ward, and then she could be transferred to the maternity uh, ward again. Another case will be a late preterm infant um, born by a cesarean section due to the transfer presentation that didn't require resuscitation at birth, but also developed respiratory distress. And this will be uh, lung ultrasound performed one hour. This is the left lung. Sorry for not using your terminology, but more or less will be anterior field, lateral field, and posterior field of the left lung. You are seeing this images with this um, thin pleural line, a bit fragmented, a small pleural effusion here, but very, really quite small. Uh, a few B lines here and also in this field but they are more um, together, almost completely uh, coalesced in B lines in posterior fields. But in the right lung, we can see more or less the same images in the anterior and lateral field, but you can see a huge consolidation with a bronchogram without pleural line and with thread sign in this area. This you can see, you can think that this baby would have high risk of predicting admission, but uh, really she didn't. She was completely asymptomatic in, in two hours of life. Uh, two hours, I think I have, no. Um, the lung was completely normal, aerated just two hours afterwards. And this is the, this case is useful for you to understand that in the first hours of life, Evaluating posterior fields is not that useful because it doesn't give you important clinical information for you to decide on the risk of a, of a patient. Okay, you have to pay attention more in these images here in anterior and lateral fields, which will make you decide what, what's the right attitude for this patient. Um, the next case was also a term newborn um, with a normal pregnancy that required also resuscitation at birth and developed respiratory distress afterwards. And this um, uh, lung ultrasound performed at birth in which you can see upper interior. Oh, this is moving quite slow, I think, I'm afraid. Sorry for this. Um, upper interior, lower interior, and lateral field. Well, you'd see there's also uh, um, ultrasound of good prognosis with only a few B lines here, a little bit more in this area, and more crowded here in, in, the, in the more dependent areas, but this is not a high risk pattern. And this is the lung ultrasound performed two hours after two hours of life. And you can see how all fields are very aviated without consolidations, without B lines. Uh, almost, I, can all, I think I can always see one B line here in this image. So the infant was, was transferred successfully at, at six hours of life to the maternity ward again. Um, this is uh, another case, just two more for you to see how we do it. This is a term baby also with a, a IUGR. And she was born due to elective cesarean section and she had a pregnant diagnosis of a hair lip. She also developed respiratory distress, but now in this case, in the first lung ultrasound that we performed in the first 30 minutes of life, she was on mild respiratory distress. We may be able to see 
how in oh, sorry how uh, we see uh, you can see the mouse here the uh, we don't see lung sliding at all we see we don't see b lines neither we say only a lines in this area here if we use the m mode here you can see the transition from the beach sign to the stratosphere sign. This is moving quite slow, I'm afraid. And however, I don't have the image of the lung point, sorry, but you can see how in, in more dependent areas, you see lung sliding again and also B lines. So this will be a pneumothorax, a small pneumothorax. And this is the lung ultrasound performed at the same moment, but in the other lung in which you can see a normal pattern with a low risk of, of being admitted to NICU. And this, as there was, as this was a, a very small uh, bubble of pneumothorax with a double lung point, with, with a lung point, sorry, at the level of the mid clavicular line that the infant didn't require um, uh, drain of the pneumothorax. And she was able to, to begin on enteral feedings and, and she just developed res mild respiratory distress for a few hours. And she was discharged home at one week of life due to the heart leap, uh, not because of the respiratory distress. And this is uh, the case that I wanted to show you as, as you have seen the previous one, this is completely different. This is also the, the, host, the clinical uh, history is, is more or less the same. It's a term infant born by a vaginal delivery, a quick delivery in, in which um, we are called because the, the infant has respiratory distress at three hours of life. Probably he will be on distress before that time. And this is the first ultrasound that we perform at three hours of life in which um, this is one lung and this is the other, upper anterior and, and lower anterior. And you can see this fake pleural line, fragmented pleural line. Uh, with lung sliding, but with lots of B lines, also this area here with the consoli small consolidation um, with uh, pleural effusion, uh, a bigger consolidation here and lots of uh, small ones uh, uh, um, next to them. There's another one here. So this lung is the type of lung in which you should really pay attention to. This infant was directly transferred to NICU and began on nasal CPAP and the baby was able to, to remove non-invasive ventilation after 36 hours of life. So this is the clinical picture of something that you have to pay attention to. This infant, if, if you work in a level one NICU, should be transferred to a, another NICU uh, to receive enough uh, mean air pressure to recruit this lung. However, the other infants will be low risk infants that really needed much than a few hours for transition in afterbirth for the respiratory distress to, to, to be alleviated. So that's it. And this is about prediction, respiratory distress and admission to NICU. And, and to show you how you can do it, you are enough, you have enough um, knowledge now to to able to differentiate from one part and to another and also may help us to rule out some diagnosis like the my pneumothorax or or other images that we've seen here i don't know if you want to comment or something or questions let me see the chat There was some, someone here asking about the median time of the ultrasounds. I, I thought maybe it was in the, in, the, in the papers about prediction of admission. Uh, it was about one hour, one hour and a half after birth. That was the median time. Okay. So if you don't have questions, then we can move on to the optimization of respiratory support using lung ultrasound. May yes. I ask a quick question? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the first part of the presentation and the, the studies that you went through for prediction, they, there is a, a great amount of thought 
And I like the classification, and that's, that's uh, very interesting. However, um, I can see that up till now, the main trigger for spotting these babies is the clinical presentation. Um, they, uh, perhaps, I'm not sure if these studies are mainly uh, for research purposes, because they are very nicely enforced, the thought of the evolving of the lungs. And when we now we actually go even uh, with a stronger belief when we go and counsel parents about TTN and the improvement and the lung fluid and cesarean section and all, all the rest of it. But uh, uh, again, uh, the clinical picture is the trigger if the baby has uh, respiratory distress signs, then we go in and maybe do a lung ultrasound scan. While uh, universal screening for these babies to predict who goes to what, that is probably still, at least in my setting, is still not very practically uh, to be practical to be implemented. But why? Because you're not able to perform lung ultrasound or? No, I think it's- I don't it, understand. Uh, my, my question is, again, sorry about the, the confusion uh, based on the prediction model um, I, I still don't think that I will be in a position to justify going and scanning all babies to predict who is going to stay with the mother and who is likely to be admitted to an ICU and who is borderline no I mean maybe I, I misunderstood you the the decision the, the, the final decision to ingrid, to admit a, uh, an infant to the NICU is just clinical I mean, is uh, a requirement of oxygen, increase of rest, uh, work of breathing, or whatever. But using lung ultrasound early at one hour of age or even uh, 30 minutes of life, you may kind of uh, divide the infants in the risk of predicting, uh, in the risk of needing admission afterwards. And if you see that pattern, the low risk pattern, then you can understand that they, this infant you you probably you won't see to you will need to see him again afterwards i don't know it it does more or less yes thank you uh, my yeah my point was how practically this could be implemented the prediction uh, model that was any of answer that thank you so much well when when a baby developed respiratory distress after birth we are called and then we go and evaluate the infant and uh, according to whatever protocol you have in your unit, you have to decide whether if the infant remains in, in, in the delivery room or in your, in your unit when you observe your patient until the distress disappears or increases and then it's transferred to the NICU. So another sign that you can use in addition to the clinical signs, the work of breathing, oxygen requirement or whatever is the lung ultrasound. So there's something more that may help you to decide whether if the patient can just stay there for a while and afterwards be transferred again to maternity ward, or maybe you can uh, observe that infant more, um, um, more intensively or even transfer directly to the NIC. That's, that will be the difference. Thanks. Okay. Thank Well, so move on now. Let's move on and we will be in the second part of the talk. We will be talking about um, NIV failure after admission to NICU. This is more or less the, the, the progression of, a, of an infant in our unit in which the baby begins with respiratory distress. It's uh, transferred to the NICU. We begin NIV. Um, in whatever type you have. Then maybe the infant requires intubation if it fails. And after the intubation, the period that the baby is intubated, maybe we need to extubate him and maybe we can predict the extubation failure. Um, afterwards, we know we would like to know when the infant's ready to be weaned from the non-invasive ventilation. And we can also use it to optimize the respiratory support that we are given to him, change in position, increases, uh, increasing of respiratory pressures or whatever. And just a few slides at the end to talk about PDA and lung ultrasound as a lot was interested in, uh, in, uh, in the last talk 
that I have. So to begin with, um, now we have our infant admitted to NICU after we've been seeing before. And we want to know whether if this infant will require uh, to be intubated or remain on non-invasive ventilation, irrespective of the, 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 the disease that this, the, this baby has. You can you have to understand that we are not talking about RDS, TTN, pneumonia, or whatever. We are talking about functional lung ultrasound. Okay, what patterns make us believe that probably that infant would need to be intubated? Okay. So um, this group of of authors uh, that created the concept of pattern one, two, and three. This uh, um, uh, late. And this are uh, uh, all the studies performed more than 10 years ago. They didn't use lung ultrasounds probably because they were first described a bit later. And uh, they evaluated the risk of being admitted, uh, sorry, the risk of being intubated once the infant were on non-invasive ventilation. So more or less the, the methods are similar. They decide, or well, they decide, no, they observe the progression of the infants according to lung ultrasound performed after two hours on nasal CPAP. And as you can see here, all infants that had this bilateral type one required intubation afterwards. And infants that had this type two or type three bilateral type three didn't require intubation at all. And taking this into account and comparing the diagnostic accuracy of this type three ultrasonographic type three bilateral uh, with uh, grade two, with an RDS in grade two by X-ray, which they refer to an homogeneous pattern with an interstitial um, infiltrate with a bronchogram. You can see now that combining the two techniques, the diagnostic accuracy of lung ultrasound was, was quite better. This other paper was published a few years before. This is also an old one, but they also divide the infants according to uh, diseases with low risk of prediction of low risk of needing mechanical ventilation or high risk diseases, which will be RDS, meconium aspiration syndrome, pneumothorax, pneumonia, okay? And low risk will be normal aeration patterns or infants with a TTN. Here you can see a double long point, which is more or less the concept that we were talking before. A sharp, uh, a sharp decrease uh, of aeration in the same image, okay? And they saw that the infants with this low risk patterns almost didn't require intubation at all. Only one infant with a TTN and one infant with uh, a metabolic acidosis or a hypothermia. And the infants with the high risk diseases really require, um, uh, almost half of them require intubation, mostly those infants with a diagnosis of RDS. And infants with a high risk pattern also require longer period of non-invasive ventilation, uh, non of invasive mechanical ventilation, high risk of requiring surfactant therapy and so on. Okay, so. Now you have more or less the idea than when you see this pattern in an ultrasound, all irrespective of you get to the final diagnosis, this baby has high risk of requiring respiratory support, high risk of being intubated also, okay? And now we're moving to uh, detection of the risk of extubation failure. We all know that invasive mechanical ventilation is frequently used in preterm infants in our units. And this is the population where the risk of having or developing extubation failure is more common, even more in term infants and compared to children or adult settings. And we don't have any test available to predict extubation failure with enough diagnostic accuracy. So, and we also know that the baby has worse outcome if we have different extubation failure, uh, uh, different attempts with, with failure of the attempt. And if we decide to remain on invasive mechanical ventilation, that we risk, increase the risk of developing BPD and being discharged from oxygen. So maybe 
Lang ultrasound can help us uh, to deal with this, in which um, we can try to more or less decide the risk of, of developing estuation failure after the initial phase of RDS, or after that, after one week of, of life in infants with evolving BPD. Or we can also use diaphragm ultrasound or combination of diaphragm, heart, and lung ultrasound that um, uh, Dr. Mohammed told you about this a few weeks ago also. So first of all, we have to think in, in the first case, we have to uh, divide the, the according to the moment of life we are talking about. In preterm infants, the first days of life are mainly related to the existence of an RDS. And this is um, this has been quite well studied by Dr. Mohammed in this paper published last year, in which they analyzed 45 infants uh, with a gestation age that less than 24, 28 weeks, in which they analyzed lung ultrasound score of the infants in, in three locations, which will be your R1, R2, and R3 in, in both lungs. And they calculated its score, which is not the same as the BRAD score. They use a score of zero with the normal aerated lung, a score one with more than three well-spaced B lines, core two, core less than B lines. And then they divided um, a score three into a small subpleural consolidation and extensive consolidation, which will be uh, number four. And they um, perform lung ultrasound one hour before the extubation in this median, um, the median days of life when they performed the extubation attempt was four or five days. And they got here the results in which you can see that those that remain extubated at three days of life really had slower uh, lung ultrasound scores before the extubation attempt. And those that didn't uh, remain extubated had higher with higher numbers. Also, uh, the same results were obtained at seven days of life. And they analyzed both lung ultrasound score and diaphragmatic measurements in the in the previous uh, ultrasound, in the previous to the extubation attempt. And they got that only lung ultrasound score was able to was related to uh, um, the risk of being reintubated afterwards, both at three days and at seven days. And they use uh, a threshold a cutoff value of 15 points to decide in, in which infant has the highest risk of, of developing extubation failure. And with this threshold, the sensitivity was 95%, which is quite good, and specificity of 85%. This other paper also performed in, in preterm infants, but not that preterm. They were lay preterm infants. Um, they were more than 200 infants that were divided into two groups according to the final outcome of success or failure of the extubation attempt. And they combined or they analyzed uh, the diagnostic accuracy of lung ultrasound, which is uh, picked in, in this uh, green line compared to a clinical model that included respiratory severity score and birth weight and length of the infant. And you can see that both models have similar diagnostic accuracy, both in the uh, initial sample and the sample that they use for validation. And this last paper, which is uh, smaller, but maybe easier to understand, um, divided the infants according to the pattern uh, observed in the lung using lung ultrasound into a normal pattern, which will be this uh, nice image of thin pleural line, few B lines, or interstitial pattern or B pattern with separated B lines, compared to uh, the normal or high risk patterns that had this white out image of colors and B lines or B consolidations. You can see that most infants with the normal patterns had a successful extubation at uh, three days after the attempt, and infants with the abnormal pattern had a 50% risk of being reintubated after the attempt. So again, when you see this before an extubation attempt, you have to think that maybe that infant um, 
could have a risk of, of requiring reintubation if you do that in that moment. Maybe you could wait a bit more or maybe you can decide or, on other therapies or whatever to try to decrease the extubation uh, failure in this infant. This is an example, a preterm infant born at, seven, at 27 weeks with this birth weight that he was born in, in another center, different from ours, and he received invasive mechanical ventilation at birth. Um, he received selective intubation in the right main bronchus and received selective surfactant administration. He was transferred to a NICU and he was uh, stable after three days. We recollocated endotracheal tube and we decided to extubate him in a third day of life with this FIO2 but we performed lung ultrasound before. And this is the left lung, the anterior area, lateral and posterior area. And you can see now this uh, alveolar interstitial pattern here in the upper part of the lung. And in the lateral and posterior, you are watching a lot of atelectasis and consolidations, maybe due to the fact that this infant receives selective surfactant administration in the right lung. This is the right lung in which you see very aeration, but also with a lot of water, still a lot of in, in, in extravascular lung water. So maybe this pattern um, should have made us um, wait and try not to extubate this infant, which we didn't do because we were kind of beginning in that moment. And we extubated him and the attempt failed just uh, 10 hours afterwards. So this is more or less um, what you can do with your exams and some other information that you can have uh, apart from just knowing if the baby has an RDS, TTN, pneumothorax or whatever. Okay. Um, but what happens after the first week of life? If you have an extremely preterm infant after the first week of life, RDS is over. But most of these infants still need to be intubated due to whatever inflammation, evolving BPD, or low respiratory drive, or whatever. And in those infants, can we use the same approach as in, in infants more mature or infants in the first days of life? Well, we don't know it yet because we have no studies published, but we believe that we have to combine both the value of lung ultrasound score and the existence of consolidations and previous to the excavation attempt. And this is um, because of this. Um, in this paper, we analyze uh, lung ultrasound progression in extremely preterm infants. And as you can see, most of them are still intubated in blue in the first weeks of life. And where we are, when we are able to um, extubate them, uh, most of them are extubated after one month then we see that in that moment, the babies still have high lung ultrasound scores, but they can be able to be extubated successfully. So maybe we have to pay attention to other signs different from the value of lung ultrasound score itself. And this is a pilot study that we performed um, with some NICUs, some Spanish NICUs, in which we analyzed the pre-extubation um, exam in infants born before 30 weeks uh, after the first week of life. And we compare the respiratory severity score in infants that were successfully estimated and those that didn't without difference. But lung ultrasound scores were a bit higher in the groups that did have extubation failure, but without really uh, uh, clinical significant differences. Uh, but we, what we also analyzed was the number of consolidations that both groups have. You can see that those with extubation failure had higher number of consolidations. And if you divide the infants with extubation failure according to the moment when they fail the extubation, those that fail after seven days, which are those that are supposedly not failing because uh, respiratory condition, because uh, sepsis or uh, surgery or whatever, well, didn't really have any consolidation at all. And if we combine all this and try to uh, analyze the risk of developing extubation failure, if we create a model, a regression model that only uses 
gestational age, birth weight, and respiratory severity score. We have uh, an area under the curve of 0 0.6, 0 0.7 to detect extubation failure. But if we add the lung ultrasound score and the number of consolidations in the lung ultrasound performed before the attempt, then we can increase the area under the curve significantly to 0 0.8. So maybe in the future, we can say that we have more evidence, not now, but maybe in, in a few years we will, that using lung ultrasound before an extubation attempt decreases the risk of extubation failure in extremely preterm infants. This is another case, this is a 24-weeker in which we are aiming to extubate her after two weeks of life. And you can see um, in this uh, four images, both um, upper posterior and lower posterior of both lungs in which you may see huge consolidation in all areas evaluated, probably due to the uh, supine, the prolonged supine position. And you can see what happens when we change the infant's position to the prone position. You can see how lung consolidations have completely disappeared. You see a normal aerated lung here and uh, a white out lung in, in this area. So this infant was extubated after this change in our position and the infant uh, had a successful extubation. Uh, we don't know if it would have been the case uh, before the changes, but you can see how you can really evaluate the lung, how it is doing and how it is aerated before trying to decide whether to extubate a baby or not. We also analyze uh, ultrasound perform after the, the extubation attempt, and you can see how there's no difference in the lung ultrasound scores, neither in the number of consolidations. So maybe this is not as useful. We are now using, uh, we are now combining results from different hospitals in, in Europe and in the US. And maybe in the future, we could give you more information about the use of lung ultrasound to reduce the extubation failure in, in this population. Another case, this is also a 24 weeker. Uh, without significant comorbidities, but we were unable to extubate her. This is at 14 days of life with FIO2 21%. This is her first extubation attempt. And this is her lung ultrasound before the attempt in which you see um, a thick pleural line, which with small consolidations here, which this is not really a bad prognosis. This is quite normal in the 24 week or two weeks of life. Uh, this is something that we can deal with. And this is something that we can uh, try to extubate this, this patient. However, the patient was um, moved to non-invasive NAVA. And although the images are not of high quality because of the distress the baby had, you can see how the lung has changed to an increase of consolidations in all areas evaluated, um, completely de-recruited lung with a big consolidation here in this area. And this baby finally um, failed the extubation attempt and required intubation again. And also we have to also pay attention to the diaphragm ultrasound or maybe the heart, but this is something that has already been uh, explained in previous talks, so I won't continue talking about. It. So before continuing, is, does anybody want to make a comment or a question or something? Okay. So if we move on, we've placed our infant in non-invasive ventilation, the patient failed, the patient was intubated, and, and after being successfully intubated, we want to know if the patient's ready to be weaned from non-invasive ventilation. I'm talking about preterm infants, okay? So this is the only study published up to date on this issue in which this group of Canada analyze the lung ultrasound score before the attempt of, of removing nasal CPAP. And you can see the area under the curve, which is quite high for using this technique before 
uh, removal nasal CPAP. And uh, before the first trial of weaning of, of non-invasive ventilation, you can see the difference between those groups with successful weaning and failed weaning, both before and after the trial. And they use this threshold of eight points to decide which infant is ready to be weaned with this sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive values in, in, in the 24 hours before the trial of TIPA withdrawal, okay? So this will be an example. This is the, the normal image that we see in extremely preterm infants on non-invasive ventilation. You see that there are not high risk patterns in this patient. They're just this um, thick pleural line with lung sliding. We don't see any consolidation. We don't see atelectasis. Um, this is just B lines in the whole lung. So this is the normal issue. So when we, this is the normal, but this is not something that we, um, although the, the baby could be on FIO2 25, 25, 21%, but if the infant still has these images in, in their lungs, they're not ready to be weaned from non-invasive ventilation. We have to wait until we see this change that we can see here. We can see there are more uh, spaced V lines. Uh, pleural line is thinner. We don't see consolidations either. So maybe if the infant's still stable with low respiratory settings and lung ultrasound seems like this, then maybe the infant is now ready to be weaned of uh, non-invasive ventilation, okay? Here I show you a case, all our real cases from our unit, 28 weaker. It's a triplet. Uh, she was born to a, a urgent cesarean section due to, to a high IUGR. She requires resuscitation at birth and she required non-invasive ventilation for eight days. Um, she didn't require surfactant at birth. And this is her lung ultrasound at day, eight days of life, in which you can see how pleural line is uh, thick, but very fragmented. It has lots of small atelectasis at the level of the pleural line. We can see lots of B lines uh, all over the lung, which are not completely coalescent, but are really quite uh, tight all together. And that, that was the left lung, and this is the right lung, in which we see more or less the same images. Okay. After this, the baby is transitioning to nasal CPAP and uh, she remains stable with this FIO2 and 20, uh, at 20, 28 days of life, she still stable. So we decide to remove nasal CPAP, but after that, the baby's not doing well. And you perform lung ultrasound and you see how the lung has changed, okay? Although you still see fragmented pleural line, you still see B lines, you see that the, can, the, the, the millimetric consolidation that were just located at the level of the pleural line have been increased. You see bigger ones here, but also bigger one in this area. This is the left lung and this is the right lung, okay? This is a slight differences, but if the infant really is not doing well, still needs oxygen, and you see these signs of de recruitment, then the infant needs to be placed again on non-invasive ventilation or nasal CPAP. So again, when you are beginning or you are deciding to remove nasal CPAP, if you see this image, this is not the best decision for that patient at that moment. May I okay. ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, please, please. You, it's about stopping non-invasive ventilation. When they are in CPAP, do you stop once? Well, you decide to stop or you do small, uh, some hours of non CPAP and then you put on CPAP and then you do some hours without CPAP. We usually remove nasal CPAP, and, but in case that the infant begins with respiratory distress or requires surgery, then that we place it again. We don't remove it um, in, in an intermittent, we don't use the intermittent, intermittent uh, way of removing nasal CPAP. Okay, another question. When we remove CPAP and then they get worse, we think they do the, uh, they under-recruited. 
and yeah. can see seen in the lung ultrasound. Well, it starts to appear in that subpleural consolidations that uh, are corresponding yes. to the um, collapse of alveolar, alveolar yes. collapse. That's the idea. That the idea is that when you use lung ultrasound, you can see the de recruitment of the lung. Okay. Here you can see this is an example of this, in which if you see that the lungs worse aerated, the baby needs oxygen again, and the and you see this appearance of uh, consolidations in mostly in all areas evaluated, then you can think that this infant is getting de recruited and needs again non-invasive ventilation. That would be the idea. Okay, thank you a lot. Thank you for your question. To decide uh, or to, sometimes people in the NICU are not, uh, not all think the same if they uh, we have to put it or take it off. And it's a, a, a way of seeing what is happening in the, in the lung of the, of the preterm. Yeah. Of course, uh, with lung ultrasound, there's a lot of people that really don't believe in it. So don't try to use this as, uh, as the Bible in your unit. You have to begin little by little. There's no much evidence yet, but it will, because this is something that really works, but you have to, to more or less understand and more or less try to get like the history of your patient. You cannot evaluate your patient only when it gets deteriorated. You have to, it's the same as the, you use your stethoscope, you, your, you explore your baby every day. So more or less you should have the evolution of the lung ultrasound pattern of the baby from birth until discharge. I'm not saying to use lung ultrasound every day, but at least every three days at the beginning, then after, after the first week, maybe weekly, so you can see the evolution of the lung and you can see the difference if the baby gets worse or, it, or if it gets better, okay? That's my recommendation. This is another example. This is a um, uh, live preterm infant born at 34 weeks. Um, uh, born by a cesarean section, didn't require resuscitation, but high work of breathing. So he was transitioned into nasal um, IPP view without improvement. So he was intubated and he received surfactant administration. This is um, the X-ray performed after the extubation in which the infant was moved to non-invasive ventilation because of work of breathing. And in the X-ray, we can see uh, telectasis in the in the right lung. So when we see the baby for the first time, as as it happened also to you, it was his ninth day of life. It was still in non-invasive ventilation with mild respiratory distress, and blood gases showed this uh, uh, moderate compensate uh, moderate respiratory acidosis. Or maybe you use different units of the PCO2 for you to understand. And maybe we think that maybe this is uh, due to the atelectasis that's still persistent in the baby. So one, some of my colleagues uh, suggested to be moved to a lateral position, but then we uh, first perform lung ultrasound. And you can see here that both in the left lung and in the right lung, there's no images at all of consolidation, neither atelectasis, uh, the lungs quite well aerated now. So we can say that the, the reason for the respiratory acidosis of this baby is not in the lung, okay? So we decided to remove non-invasive ventilation. We, um, the baby really had sick mucus plugs in, in, the, in, the, in the nose, so we deobstructed it. And in the first, in the next few hours, uh, although he persisted on my respiratory distress, he normalized low gases and he was able to be weaned from non-invasive ventilation successfully. And now a few words about also how to optimize ventilatory support, although this is something uh, quite viable because it depends on each patient and the disease they have and the situation where they are. But I wanted to show you just a few cases 
this is uh, a, a late preterm infant with uh, uterine growth retardation, um, birth well, born with uh, 700 grams without respiratory distress at birth, but she required laparotomy after that due to a spontaneous intestinal perforation. She was stable in road respiratory settings after the surgery, but three days after, when we get to the NICU, she's on um, um, a peak uh, inspiratory pressures of 19, um, FiO2 40%. So maybe we can think that they, maybe this infant's developing nosocomial pneumonia. So we perform lung ultrasound and next to the heart, we can see this consolidation here uh, with a bronchogram. Okay, this is the, the red lung. Uh, so we decide to aspirate the mucus plugs and nurse her. We place her on lateral left and uh, lateral uh, left lateral decubitus. We perform after this a new lung ultrasound in which we see that the consolidation is improved, but still not completely aerated. We perform um, uh, cultures, uh, blood get, blood analysis without signs of infection, also tracheal aspirate without any uh, bacteria. So we decided to increase respiratory settings and finally uh, replace the endotracheal tube, which was not correctly positioned also. And after all these measurements, we were able to recruit the area and we cannot see the consolidation at all. So after this, the baby uh, re was transitioned again to low respiratory settings as she was before and we were able to excavate her successfully. Another example, this is quite often a theme in, in our patients. This is preterm infant, uh, 20, born at 29 weeks. Um, he had a perinatal asphyxia and severe RDS. He required two doses of surfactant and invasive mechanical ventilation. He was extubated at five days of life. And as you have been um, listening before, uh, we perform routine lung ultrasound at seven days of life, usually in these patients. The patient now was stable with normal gases, uh, low FiO2, and in the lung ultrasound performed at seven days of life. This is the lateral area of lung, one lung and posterior area in which you can see a huge consolidation with air bronchogram, static bronchogram. And the, the patient didn't have fever. Not, a, not a, any signs of infection. This is something quite usual. And so we decided not to act really because he was quite stable, but we decided to reevaluate him again. Sorry. And the, after this, on the next day, in which we can see that the blow gases are getting worse, the baby uh, needs the same oxygen, but with lower saturation. Uh, values so and the consolidation is even bigger so this is something quite usual and has um, easy solution because we just need to prone the baby uh, a few hours this is at 10 a.m and at 6 p.m uh, we can see how the patient has really improved uh, both normal glasses in that moment FiO2 21 percent with normal saturation values, the lung uh, has greatly improved. And then we can, in this way, we can optimize respiratory support in, in this position. There are many publications about recruitment maneuvers in infants ventilated in during anesthesia or whatever, but we don't know if this really has clinical impact in very low birth weight infants on extremely preterm infants. I mean, not in, in acute exacerbation, which is quite clear that we need it. I mean, in small infants, very small infants like this T1, oh, sorry, sorry. These T1s are 24 weekers uh, in which we are performing return uh, lung ultrasound. They didn't have respiratory distress, normal thoracic excursion, low FIO settings. And you can see that both have huge consolidations here uh, with a bronchogram inside. They are related to uh, 
um, uh, the in the trackel two was too deep, so they had this uh, uh, huge consolidations with really without really clinical significance in that moment. So we don't know whether if we have to really change our action or change the way we manage our infants now that we are able to see this. However, there's no evidence on this issue, of course. However, we have this paper that I wanted to show you in which these are adults, this is an adult ICU in which um, they treated inf uh, adults after RDS uh, with two different groups. They had this intervention group in which both physicians and nurses treated the, the adult patients uh, using lung ultrasound to decide whether to increase respiratory settings, nurse the patient, change the patient's position, and the control group didn't, did quite uh, standard treatment uh, without lung ultrasound. You can see that the time on mechanical ventilation was reduced in the intervention group also the treatment time in ICU and the total aspiration time. But also the intubation group had reduced number of aspiration events and reduced number of ventilator and not so common ventilator uh, pneumonia, okay? So maybe in, in a few years time, we will be using lung ultrasound as well as our phone uh, stethoscope or, or other, um, um, clinical signs that we use to evaluate our infants. And just a few slides about uh, PDA and lung ultrasound because uh, Alok was interested the, the other day. And these are the three papers published uh, um, analyzing lung ultrasound scores in the first days of life in, in infants with uh, persistent PDA. Although they have um, some methodological issues that um, make them not very um, understandable. But this one, which was published uh, to try to use lung ultrasound for BPD prediction, they also analyze lung ultrasound score in different moments according to the situation of the, of the ductus. And they divided infants with a close uh, ductus arteriosus and a PDA. And you can see how there are difference in the values of lung ultrasound score between two groups at day one, at day three, four, and at day seven. But afterwards, there's no differences at all. More or less, uh, although the infants still have a PDA, the values of lung ultrasound scores are more or less the same that those that didn't. And this is um, another paper about lung ultrasound score evolution in extremely preterm infants in which they analyze uh, the infants according to different complications. Infants with a BPD were those with light gray, um, with, uh, do, uh, sorry, with light gray, middle gray, sorry, in which you can see how BPD patients have persistently high lung ultrasound scores and infants with complications different from BPD, uh, for example, PDA that require treatment, late onset sepsis, pneumothorax, persistent pulmonary hypertension. They have these uh, light gray boxes. They, they also have persistently high PDA that um, begin to decrease at about one month of age. And this is the same moment that infants more immature had this decrease of lung ultrasound scores at the same moment. So. Are we really watching the evolution of PDA or the evolution of very extreme uh, preterm infants? We don't know it yet. We don't know if lung ultrasound score is usual to monitor pulmonary flow in PDA in extremely preterm infants. And we don't know if we can monitor lung ultrasound, uh, we can monitor lung water using lung ultrasound. The thing, the, what I tried to explain to you the other day is this abstract that we will be presenting in the past meeting uh, next month, in which we analyze um, preterm infants before 32 weeks um, with lung ultrasound and echocardiography. And we did show uh, a significant correlation between PDA uh, variables in echocardiography and variables related to diastolic dysfunction of the heart. However, if we analyze only those born before 38 weeks, 
then we see that there's no correlation at all between lung ultrasound and, and this echocardiography measurements. So these extremely preterm infants do have persistently high lung ultrasound scores, irrespective of they have PDA or not. Okay, so. And the only paper published up to date about the use of lung ultrasound in, in infants with PDA is this one. This is uh, from, uh, 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 from the group from uh, Patrick McNamara, in which they analyzed lung ultrasound score after PDA ligation, percutaneous PDA ligation in, in five extremely preterm infants. And you can see how uh, the values of lung ultrasound score before the ligation of the PDA decreased just one hour before uh, at, uh, at the same level at the um, heart, out, the cardiodacus also decreased and they remain lower after the procedure until six to 12 hours. And this is performed in infants with a percutaneous PDA closure at one to two months of age, which is more or less when, when the lung begins to aerate better in this population. So I hope that after this long talk, now you are able to understand that if you see this pattern, this baby will have, if not admitted, we have high risk of being admitted. If he's on non-invasive ventilation, then he has high risk of requiring intubation. And in his, uh, and if the preterm infant is on non-invasive ventilation with this lung ultrasound, he has high risk of of failing the non-invasive ventilation withdrawal, okay? Although you have to take into account that this pattern is good for stable, extremely low birth weight infants, okay? This is not a back prognosis pattern, but this means that that infant would not be able to cope without non-invasive ventilation. And I hope that you have some questions or something you want to comment on. So folks, uh, please feel free to come in with questions. I have a quick question. Yes, please. Uh, in a baby who is uh, on non-invasive ventilation and you are thinking of uh, taking the non-invasive ventilation off, but the ultrasound scan picture is similar to what we have seen in your presentation. Uh, but the other parameters are stable, the blood gases, the FiO2 are fine. Is there a point in escalating the non-invasive ventilation, for example, increasing the, the CPAP pressure in order to speed up the weaning or just to sit tight and wait and see? Well, it depends on the baby and the reason for needing non-invasive ventilation. If the infant is on uh, is a persistent doctor's arteriosus that maybe he could be uh, begin on diuretics, or maybe you have you may think of treating PDA, um, whatever. Um, if uh, but not increasing respiratory settings, I think because if the baby is stable with low respiratory settings and it's a, an extremely preterm infant, you only have to wait. You you only the only thing that you can do is just wait because the lungs not de recruited. It's the lung that he needs to have at that moment. But you, the only information that you can have uh, with the evidence that we have now is that that infant probably won't be able to cope without non-invasive ventilation. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Any other questions, folks? Okay, I am going to take this opportunity again to thank Almudina. Thank you so much for an absolutely fantastic talk. And again, a little bit more reason for us to kind of start looking at babies for slightly older. But I think coming back to uh, one of the important points that Almudina has made is it's really important that we kind of have a baseline kind of a view for babies who are extremely preterm. And uh, I think starting next month, you know, there's an opportunity for us to maybe look at a few babies like that to kind of see how they're doing and see if we might be able to kind of get some some scans that are that are serial scans to kind of look at the evolution uh, of lung disease. It would be a really good practice exercise and something that we we I think I will add to the logbooks uh, after this talk. 
thank you so much, Almedina, and thank you, everybody. I'm really grateful for you know everybody's patience and for the peer review. Peer review will carry on. And uh, on Sunday, uh, what we will be talking about is some of the medical legal aspects, uh, especially uh, with regards to lung ultrasound, but we will have peer review before that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lark, and thank you all for your attention. Congratulations, because you're really, all of you are doing quite a good job. You're on the way. God bless you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.